Hey friends, welcome back. If you made it here, hopefully that means you've watched my previous two videos on the other types of X-ray interaction, that is elastic scatter and photoelectric absorption. If you haven't, I highly recommend you watch those two videos first before coming into this one, as it'll make a lot more sense. Now in this video, we're gonna finish off the explainer series on X-ray interactions by talking about Compton scatter, what it is and how it affects our day-to-day -day imaging. Let's go. The Compton scatter effect gets its name from the American physicist, Arthur Compton, who observed this effect in 1923. So that's exactly a hundred years ago from now for those watching in 2023. Fundamentally, Compton scattering occurs when an incoming high energy X-ray photon interacts with the outer shell electrons of an atom in our tissues, resulting in a recoiled Compton electron and a deflected lower energy, that is a longer wavelength, X-ray photon, which goes into a different direction that's essentially scattered radiation. Now let's unpack that and see what's happening on the atomic level. So unlike photoelectric absorption or the photoelectric effect, where the incoming X-ray photon energy had to be close or slightly higher than the binding energy of the inner K-shell electrons, Compton scattering occurs with the much higher energy X-rays that hit the patient and interacts predominantly with the non-K-shell electrons, that is the outer shell electrons. This is because for this interaction to take place, the binding energy of the electron must be a lot less than the incoming X-ray photon's energy. And we know that as you go out from the center, the binding energies decrease. So when you think about it, Compton scatter actually interacts with the vast majority of electrons in a sample of tissue because the K-shell only houses two electrons and the rest are in the L, M and N shells and so on, depending on the atomic number of the atom. I talked about electron shells in the previous video, so I'll link that down below for you. Now the question to ask is, if after a Compton type interaction, that X-ray isn't fully absorbed and therefore continues on its path, but now with a reduced energy and in a different direction, how much is it reduced by? Well, we can use the following formula, which captures all of this, where lambda two is the wavelength of the scattered X-ray photon, Lambda one is the wavelength of the incoming or incident X-ray photon. H is Planck's constant. M is the mass of the electron. C is the velocity or speed of light. And cos theta is the cosine of the angle of the scattered X-ray photon. And remember that wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. So an increased wavelength is equivalent to a lower energy. <sighs> okay, there's a lot going on there and it's easy to get overwhelmed. But when you really think about it, H M and C are all constants, so we can just look these up. And so the energy lost by the X-ray photon, which is the difference between lambda one and two, is really just highly dependent on the change of angle, that is cos theta. Because as the angle increases, the level of photon energy loss is greater and vice versa. Now you could very well just remember that relationship, but let's try to understand why that's the case just by following the logic of the math in the equation I showed you earlier. Try to pay attention here, it can get a little confusing. So as the angle or theta increases, cos theta decreases in value. And you can check this on your calculator yourself. So for example, cos theta is about 0.866, cos 60 is about 0.5, cos 80 is about 0.17, and cos 90 is just zero. Okay, cool. Now that we know that as the angle increases, our cos theta value decreases, let's look at the brackets in the formula, where it's one minus cos theta. So now as the angle increases, cos theta decreases, but the value in the bracket increases because we're taking away a smaller value from one as the angle goes up, make sense? But now since that whole part of the equation, mc one minus cos theta is in the denominator, that is the lower part of the fraction, it actually decreases the value of the right-hand side of the equation because as a denominator increases in value, it's like dividing a number by a larger value. And so it actually brings the total value down. So if on the left-hand side of the equation is just the difference between the scattered and the incoming X-ray photon, say it's for example, I don't know, five minus six is minus one, where the scattered photon has an energy of five and the incoming X-ray photon has an energy of six, which is a net loss of minus one points of energy. If the denominator on the right-hand side goes up, as I mentioned earlier, it actually simply decreases the left-hand side of the equation. So it'll go from minus one to minus two or minus three, which means more energy lost. Now, obviously these numbers are just to show you an example, they're not real. So in conclusion, as the angle of the deflection increases, so does the level of energy loss between the incident and scattered photon. Okay, you still with me? Hopefully you are. Again, if you didn't understand, please rewind and watch that part again, or you could completely skip it, that's cool too. But this way, if you forget it, you could just look at the formula and figure out in two minutes. This is how I like to understand it. If you have a better and simpler way of getting it, then by all means use that method. The scattered photon angle will actually give a very specific wavelength change. So if our incoming photon has a short wavelength, meaning it's high energy, then it'll lead to quite a large energy loss. Whereas if the photon has a long wavelength, 
that is a low energy, then it'll lead to a small fractional change and therefore not that much energy lost in comparison. So in other words, if the incident photon energy is high, a lot of energy can be lost and transferred to the Compton electron. But that's not the case if the incident photon energy is relatively low. Unlike what we saw in the previous video with photoelectric absorption, which only really occurs with the two inner casial electrons, Compton scattering on the other hand mainly occurs with the non casial electrons and therefore occurs with a much larger sample of electrons and so the probability of Compton scattering occurring is closely related to the number of electrons present within the atom. However, it's actually independent of the atomic number. But hold on, doesn't the atomic number also correspond to the number of electrons, assuming a non-ionized atom? Well, yes, but when looking at, for example, bone and muscle tissue, even though the atomic numbers of these tissues are different by almost a factor of two, where bone has an effective atomic number of about 14 and muscle about seven to eight, the electron density and therefore the number of electrons is quite similar. So in summary, there are a few key points to consider about Compton scattering. First, the incoming X-ray photon has an energy that is considerably greater than the binding energy of the electron it's interacting with, as opposed to the photoelectric effect, which needs to be similar or slightly higher. Second, after the interaction takes place, the incoming X-ray photon loses some of its energy and changes direction. This is basically the scattering that we see in our images, where in the photoelectric effect, we saw the energy just get absorbed with an ejected photoelectron. In Compton scatter, there is just an ejected Compton electron and the X-ray continues to propagate as scatter, but now with a slightly lower energy and a different direction. Recall this is the lambda two in the equation from earlier. Third, this interaction generally involves outer shell electrons, that is non K shell electrons. Again, simply because there needs to be a large difference between the incoming X-ray photon and the binding energy of the electron. And since the binding energies decrease as you go out from the nucleus, it's much more likely to occur with the outer shell electrons, which accounts for the vast majority of electrons in an atom and a sample of tissue. Fourth, as I mentioned, the probability of Compton scattering occurring is directly related to the electron number and independent of the atomic number of the attenuator, whereas the latter is the opposite for photoelectric absorption. And finally, we can see from this graph that whenever we're taking an X-ray of someone, we can't fully eliminate Compton scatter. And that's why noise is always a fundamental part of any image, even if it's a very small amount. Both photoelectric absorption and Compton scatter will always take place. So it's up to us to choose an appropriate KVP that takes into account these two interactions and balances the effects to help answer the clinical question. And speaking of KVP, from what we have learned so far, we know that we want to reduce the effects of Compton scatter, that is to reduce the bad scatter in our images, and increase the effects of photoelectric absorption because this leads to an improved contrast between the tissues of interest. So it's reasonable to conclude that generally a lower KVP would yield a better image quality, to a certain degree, of course. However, it's never that simple. First of all, a lower KVP is equivalent to a higher patient absorbed dose. And secondly, sometimes if we have a quite a large patient coming in for a chest X-ray, we actually need to compromise the image contrast so we preferentially increase our KVP in order to have enough penetration to get a decent quality image. So there are challenges, and as you can see, it's situation specific and case based. All right, we're done. We made it to the end, very well done. Now hopefully you understand all you need to know about Compton scatter, along with elastic scattering and the photoelectric effect, which we covered earlier. These concepts take a few times to sink in, so I encourage you to sleep on it and then come back tomorrow and watch the videos again to get a fuller understanding. Again, if you got any value from this, please give it a like, and if there's any topics you'd like me to cover, drop it in the comment section below. Now to get a better understanding of the X-ray interactions from the beginning, click here to watch that first video on elastic scattering and stay curious.